Okay, okay, we're recording, yeah. So just uh, welcome everybody to, um, this is the third in our series of the Student Alum Networking Series. And also it's Earth Day, so it happens to be very nice that we have this, um, uh, you know, a nice celebration of Earth Day by having one of our alums come back to talk. Um, and it is Sarah Fuller, who is the Operations Manager for the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Shipboard Scientific Services Group in Woods Hole. Um, she graduated from GSO in, in 2015, and her major professor was Stephen Carey, who's also an alum. But I'm going to turn this right over now to Associate Dean David Smith, who knew Sarah when she was here, and we'll further introduce her. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, actually, I, I guess I knew Sarah even before she was here as a student. Uh, Sarah actually has a very long history with uh, GSO. She, she first came to us in 2007 as a SERFO student and worked with uh, Mark Wimbush and Dwight Coleman on, on a really interesting pro project, I thought, in the, in the Black Sea, right? Yep. Black Sea data set. Yeah. And so, um, you know, typically we, we use the uh, SERFO program to try and recruit graduate students. And uh, but Sarah left and after that summer and um, uh, did some things I hope that she will talk about uh, coming up. But then she kind of came back and sort of tangentially was working on EV Nautilus with, again, with Dwight and, and Katie Croft and uh, uh, Bob Ballard. And so she was, uh, you know, affiliated with us again through the EV Nautilus. I think that was around 2010. And then finally in uh, 2012, she committed to coming back as a graduate student. So the, uh, the, I think that's the longest gap between the circle year and the actual matriculation. But uh, we finally got her. And so she came back and, and as Veronica said, did a very nice project with Steve Carey. And uh, she is well known for her uh, organizational skills, say, and her, her uh, and a bit, being a bit of a perfectionist. And so I think those skills are, are, are um, serving her well in her position over at Huey. So, so Sarah, great to see you again. So take it over. Great, thanks, David. All right, let me just try and share my screen. Uh, All right. Okay, I think you all can see that just fine. So uh, thank you for having me on this uh, kind of dreary Earth Day. Uh, the clouds are parting uh, right now, but um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about all of the field work that I've done and how it's led me into a field support role. Um, so supporting academia uh, through that. Um, <clears throat> So like many of you, uh, it's a very circuitous path to get to where you will want to end up. Um, my path started with undergrad at St. Lawrence University in upstate New York. And then I actually went and taught for a little while and simultaneously started working with the Ocean Exploration Trust. And that eventually brought me back to GSO as uh, David said. And after GSO, I went on to Sea Education Association and now I'm at Hui. Um, so I'm going to focus mostly on the latter half of this, but you can't get there from here without understanding the context of what I did before I was a grad student. So first, uh, undergraduate experiences are where you get your fundamentals and where you really learn to have a lot of fun in the field. So I was a geology major. I found it very intuitive. Uh, I'm a detail-oriented person. Taking notes is second nature to me. Uh, I had amazing faculty at um, St. Lawrence who uh, combined with a lot of scholarships and working three jobs while I was there, was able to do some really cool field work. So I got out, uh, the first field work I ever did was doing scuba surveys of reefs down in Curacao and comparing them to the paleo reef terraces uh, that compose a lot of the island. Um, so that was also my first introduction to oceanography as a multidisciplinary subject. Uh, so it kind of started to wet my whistle for oceanography. I also got opportunities to go up to Alaska to do some glacial geomorphology work, which again, all of this combined was really formative in what I decided to pursue over the next, you know, so many years. Um, but like David said, I am 
somebody who is interested in a lot of different things. Um, and while geology is really awesome, I decided my freshman year that I was going to take a break and move to uh, Switzerland, actually, and take courses there. Um, my sophomore summer, uh, when I went back to St. Lawrence, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go move to the Bighorns in Wyoming and work on a dude ranch. Then my junior year, I decided to swing that pendulum back in the other direction. And I moved to East Africa for four and a half months um, and was studying at the University of Nairobi doing biodiversity conservation. <clears throat> and I got to learn literal field work, um, picking tea here up by the Ugandan border, um, learning that to get to a lot of field sites meant very long, uh, very, very long trips through the bush. Um, which often resulted in getting the truck stuck. Um, but it allowed me to experience uh, biodiversity conservation through uh, the people who lived there and their efforts. And it really made me value how easy we have it in the United States. Um, but field work could mean you're sleeping with cattle at the base of Kilimanjaro, or it could mean that you're standing on a glacier, you know basically on the equator at the top of Mount Kenya. Um, so there were a lot of really cool experiences that I had when I was living in East Africa, which doesn't seem like it would bring itself to oceanography, but it was actually really critical. Um, Rob Bacalny was running Surfo at the time and I had applied, but I wasn't matching with any of my top choices. And uh, I called Rob from a street corner in Nairobi and uh, he basically said, well, you're a geology major and a sociology major. Clearly you can travel well. Do you have any interest in being paired with this group doing archeology span stuff in the Black Sea? Um, that was an easy yes for me. And I ended up doing my surfo work with Dwight Coleman and Mark Wimbush, looking at picnic line variability in the North Central Black Sea and its impacts on shipwrecks and bed forms. So this was my first experience analyzing shipboard data and the folks I was working with from Katie Croft Bell and Webb Pinner um, to Catalina Martinez doing some outreach work and Kat Kantner and Brennan Phillips. Um, basically Surfo was a blast because not only Mark and Dwight were so great but all the other people I was working with uh, were really encouraging. And they liked my work ethic and they invited me to go out to sea with them. Uh, so <clears throat> I went out to Ukraine to help collect more data. And that turned into the most epic of sea stories. That's probably best shared over a beer. Um, but I started on a Ukrainian dive boat with an AUV and some amphora conservation uh, equipment. And I ended up on the NRV Alliance. Uh, disembarking in Turkey a few weeks later. So not the plan, um, but it was a pretty amazing experience uh, to go out to sea um, and collect the data yourself after processing it all summer. But as much as Surfo wet my whistle, like David said, I didn't actually stay um, in oceanography initially. I went uh, to uh, pursue teaching in the mountains. So I moved west. Uh, into a log cabin in Wyoming and started a master's program through the Teton Science Schools um, and University of Wyoming. So there, the field was our classroom. Uh, it was a residential education program that uh, <clears throat> regular school standards were taught, but we used our place as our main tool for educating. After about a year of being there, I found that I could get a full-time job teaching in Colorado for a nonprofit without actually completing my degree, which was very expensive. Um, so off I went to the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. And when I was there, um, I was teaching all the science classes in the public schools, K through fifth grade, as well as working on an educational farm called Rock Bottom Ranch. We had a CSA, we had chickens, goats, pigs, uh, you name it, we ha had it all. Um, and we were really working on educating uh, people that farming can go hand in hand with wildlife. They don't have to compete. Um, so I'd been there for about a year 
when Katie Croft Bell gave me a call and you know she said Ballard had bought a boat and the Institute for Exploration, which was the precursor to the Ocean Exploration Trust, um, needed some help. So I talked with my boss in Aspen and he agreed to transfer me to a role where I was a winter naturalist. And that allowed me to guide in the winter time and in the springs up in the mountains, still teaching and freed up my summers and falls to go out to sea with the Ocean Exploration Trust. So with OET, um, I was immediately you know, thrown into the deep end. Uh, I met the ship initially in Santorini, Greece for the first time. Um, and suddenly I was in charge of samples and data and training all of our visiting science teams on our systems. Um, IFE <clears throat> had the ROVs for many years and was used to having a flyaway system, but we hadn't owned a, a ship before. We hadn't had a specific home base. Um, so a lot of our protocols for operating in labs and preserving samples and managing the data all had to be rethought. Um, so no pressure on that front. Um, and over the years, while I was spending my summers and falls with OET, I was communicating you know, our scientific findings over uh, Nautilus Live, which you all can see in the Inner Space Center. Um, I was processing data from our multi-beams, our sub-bottom profilers, our side scans, all the environmental sensors on our ROVs. I was training scientists and guests on our protocols and ship systems, designing and implementing you know, our sampling documentation systems along with our doctors on call for the different species or rocks or whatever have you that we were collecting. Um, we had a couple of high school interns that were <laughs> put with me to help me with documentation. Um, it really just was something that we were covering. Uh, I was, a, again, wearing a, many, many hats, um, but I was happy to do it. Eight hour watches, um, you know, four and fours and, you know, data manipulation and uh, documentation in between. And that got me to, you know, having a, my first my name on my first publications. So I was a guest editor for the first two oceanography supplements um, that were about the field seasons of the Nautilus. I started, um, you know, contributing to articles here and there and got my first uh, publication uh, in a scientific journal, which was pretty exciting. Um, I might have a technical glitch with these videos, but we'll give it a shot. Um, my apologies if they don't run. Um, but when I was with OET, oops, while I was, <laughs> try again, uh, while I was with OET, I, we need some plane experts. Oh, there's Brian's yeah. voice. Um, we, I sailed on 26 different cruises. Uh, I went into the territorial waters of at least um, 15 different countries. I was a part of expeditions that covered, you know, pretty much anything that you can find on the seafloor, um, Nautilus found it. So it was natural from all this exposure uh, and from my surfo experience to be pulled back to URI. And when I finally made up my mind that I would give up my gig in Colorado working for the winters um, and to go back to school, it was really because I wanted to work with Steve Carey. So I had sailed with him probably on five or six different cruises, worked with him in the lab. Uh, he was a dream to work with, so much fun and so smart. And uh, so one day we were floating off the coast of Italy, looking at scoria bombs that we had recovered from the seafloor. And I asked him if he would consider taking me on as a student. And his response was to laugh and just say, what took you so long? Um, so that is how I ended up at GSO, um, back to school. Uh, I was in my late twenties by then. Um, so I was a little bit older than some of my peers, but that didn't matter at all. Um, <clears throat> I earned my keep when I was at GSO, working in the rock and core repository, maintaining the databases in conjunction with NOAA's uh, National Geophysical Data Center and curating incoming samples and generating and distributing uh, the subsamples as requested. I also kept my toes in education 
uh, by working with the Office of Marine Programs as an educational outreach scientist, which I know Marianne Scholl is on this call and I highly recommend any of you grad students to get involved with her programs. They're really, really wonderful. Um, and you get, a, you get a lot of sense of purpose and accomplishment um, from doing outreach programs like that. I also TA'd for um, Steve's undergrad courses. And uh, because I'm, I like to stay busy, I was also one of the founding contributors of the blog Ocean Bites, which um, I'm sure a few of the current graduate students are writing for now. So one of my biggest highlights while I was at GSO was getting funding from an alumni grant and a Grad Student United Travel Grant. And that allowed me to participate in a field camp with the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology uh, in a field camp in Iceland. So being used to looking at outcrops and sediment deposits through the very narrow lens underwater of an ROV, uh, it was really lovely to get back onto outcrops that I could see for miles. And uh, being on an ocean plate spreading center and a hot spot, along with both subglacial and ocean influences, Iceland was really a mecca for my academic interests. Uh, we explored everything from basaltic AA flows on the Reykjanes Peninsula, which is having an eruption right now, if you haven't seen it. It's pretty cool. I recommend looking it up. Um, but also looking to the rhyolites found at Hecla, and it culminated with a really big field project um, mapping flows uh, from the Reykjafjordur region, which is in the northwestern area of Iceland. So it's basically at the end of the road, as far northwest as you can get. Um, and as you already know, I'm sure Iceland is extremely photogenic, uh, but nothing will make you appreciate uh, a place more and feel more connected to it than spending weeks camping in the rain, eating freeze-dried rations, and scrambling through blueberry brambles with a backpack full of rocks. Um, but my research when I was at GSO was with Steve on the distribution of fine-grained tephra from a 1650 eruption, a submarine eruption from Colombo volcano in Greece. So this uh, Santorini is only about seven kilometers to the southwest of Colombo, and it was populated. So there are a lot of accounts of earthquakes and tsunamis, surges, ashfall, and even asphyxiation from the noxious gases. So the local populations uh, were really impacted by this eruption, and it was very clearly uh, a natural hazard. Uh, that it's, and the, the volcano is still active today, so one to be monitored. Um, previous examination with Hercules of the interior of the crater at Colombo revealed well stratified deposits of fines depleted lapilli. And so my project was answering the question of, well, where did all the fine material go? What happened to it? So uh, I was looking at sediment box cores and gravity cores that were taken throughout the whole area. Um, and correlating them with Colombo versus Santorini, which is a different volcanic center, um, using lithologic and sedimentological uh, and geochemical uh, parameters. And the newly correlated distribution area that we found was what you see here in pink is was nearly five times greater than the seismically inferred area that you see in purple. So this isn't my defense. I'm not gonna get into the weeds with you all, but I will say that if any of you are as amazed by the art of nature as I am, I highly recommend getting some funding to do some SEM imaging over on the main campus. Uh, still is one of the biggest highlights of sitting behind a computer of my whole career. Um, what, you, what you see in these images is really astounding. Um, but long story short, uh, not only were we looking for um, where did it go, but how did it get there in terms of the tephra dispersal. And we found that basically there were um, there's preferential uh, deposition into the northeast and the southeast basins of Colombo, which strongly indicated the transport of tephra uh, being dominated by sediment gravity flows. 
So some were likely generated by the collapse of the submarine eruption columns, whereas others were attributed to the Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities that were generated uh, once the eruption became subaerial and there was a lot of fallout of the tephra on the sea surface <clears throat> from the subaerial eruption columns. So the striking contrast between the really coarse lapilli that we saw in the crater wall versus the fine tephra, which was only 20 to 30 kilometers from the vent, highlights really effective sorting of fine ash from the coarse material during the submarine explosive eruptions and likely caused variation in settling velocities because of the particles in air versus water. But one of the most beautiful parts about being at GSO is uh, you make a lot of friends and they often become colleagues as you progress in your careers. Um, and to help keep your sanity, there was a lot of outdoor adventuring, uh, bike riding, ice climbing, rock climbing, ice skating, skiing, spear fishing, surfing, we did it all. Um, you name it, there was someone to go on an adventure with and uh, there was always really nerdy dialogue, which I think we all appreciate. But the fun is not going to prevent you from having existential crises uh, as you approach your defense and what comes next. Um, I had one myself. Uh, I was literally in the shower shampooing my hair and I had a panic attack. <laughs> and I had a few more cruises with OET lined up. Um, the field camp in Iceland had actually asked me to come back and TA. And I, that was it. I didn't have anything lined up for the fall. I, I was graduating and I'm a planner and I didn't have a plan. And I was panicking because I also thought I should be getting my PhD. And what was I doing leaving academia uh, without a PhD? So literally with soap in my hair, rush into Steve's office. Um, and Steve being Steve talked me off a ledge. Uh, he knew that I'd end up where I needed to be and reassured me that even though I would definitely excel in a PhD level research. Given all of the things I'm interested in, did I really want to be that narrowly focused? Um, and was that really what I wanted out of the future of my career? So sage advice uh, for someone like me. And I went back to the drawing board and lots and lots of job applications. Um, and that is how I ended up with Sea Education Association and transitioning from a lot of field work to a lot of field support. So uh, what happened with SEA is that I interviewed initially for an assistant scientist job uh, and they sail on their square rigged brigantines, uh, you know, all over the world. And during the course of that interview, the person interviewing me revealed that she and her science program coordinator job was actually moving south and her job was gonna be opening up so I should be in contact with whoever, whoever comes after her um, about a position uh, to which I immediately thought, well, I, I can do that job. So I set my Google alerts. I checked daily for the opportunity to be posted. And before long, um, I was in you know, several rounds of interviews uh, with SEA and eventually landed the role and was on my way to Woods Hole. So the ships uh, were never home, uh, spare for the core with Kramer that comes into uh, Woods Hole, into Dyer's Dock, you know, about once a year for maybe three weeks at a time. Otherwise, the ships, uh, you know, the Kramer circumnavigated the North Atlantic at the time. Uh, the Robert C. Siemens, our other ship, was based in the South Pacific, going to Honolulu and Fiji, Tahiti, American Samoa. Kiribati, Wallace and Fortuna, um, the whole East Coast of New Zealand, you name it, uh, the Siemens has been there. So my role when I was at SEA was actually shore-based um, and with all of those trips all over the world, it meant that uh, somebody had to do all of the marine research clearances for the programs um, sampling in those waters. So I was doing, 80 different uh, research authorizations a year um, with all of the different countries we were going to. And that includes, you know, following up for all of the reporting and giving them all of the data, things like that. 
For a comparison, our two ships at Hui max have like maybe 10 clearances a year. Um, and the chief scientists for those cruises are responsible for doing all of the reporting. I was doing eight times that at SEA um, by myself, which in, it, in and of itself is a full-time job. But I was also supervising and training assistant scientists, um, managing and planning our science equipment budgets, writing uh, NSF grant proposals for ocean instrumentation and shipboard equipment, uh, managing instrumentation calibrations and repairs, uh, international shipping. I personally think that I should have another master's just in the challenges of shipping alone. Um, so that being said, uh, with the ships going to such cool places, um, naturally the best way to support a ship from shore is to know how the ship operates. So I still got to go out to sea probably about twice a year, one time to each ship. Um, sometimes it would be to, you know, a ship, a shipyard um, for maintenance uh, in a place like Mallorca or, you know, sailing over the Roaring Forties or through the Roaring Forties over the Chatham Rise, um, you know, off the east coast of New Zealand. So things like that made all of the, the tough paperwork really worth it. Um, while I was at SEA, you know, some of the things I learned that I probably wouldn't have learned elsewhere was how complex scheduling uh, crew and scientists are when ships are in very remote places, uh, how much lab you can fit into a very small space, net deployments and CTDs from a sailboat, how to properly toss heaving lines, splice and whip a new thimble, <laughs> you know, interpreting weather faxes, the art of rust busting, how to swing a compass, um, you know, even fighting fires in shipboard scenarios. We were trained on it all. So uh, really unique opportunities at SEA. Um, and something that few people I think know about is that SEA has a repository of samples that it's been collecting for over 40 years. Um, if you think of 40 years of daily North Atlantic Newston toes um, twice a day, uh, there's a lot of data that SEA has. So just a plug, if anybody's interested in, you know, sea surface uh, critters from the North Atlantic. Um, I, in particular, because I was managing all the repositories and the data, I ended up writing a paper um, with some folks from Hui on the tar balls that had been collected in our Newston toes, which was pretty interesting work. Now, I knew I wasn't gonna stay with SEA for very long. Uh, to be honest, I needed a bigger paycheck and nonprofits like SEA just can't afford that. Um, so while I knew I wanted to leave SEA, I also knew that I was in the right town um, for going somewhere else. So after a few years, I heard of actually two different opportunities opening up at Hui uh, through the grapevine. One of them was with the Jason ROV group who needed a logistics coordinator. And the other was with the shipboard scientific services group um, in a mission planning role. So right away, I was trying to be sneaky and started scheduling casual coffee dates with people who could divulge um, some more information for me. And before long, I began at Hui uh, as the in that mission planning role as the research vessel science coordinator. Um, led to some perks like getting to hang out in Alvin when it's you know just sitting in the high bay pretending like I'm a pilot even though I'm not. Um, but my main role was coordinating the logistics and the planning for both of our Hui vessels, so the Atlantis and the Armstrong, um, including all of our MOB and DMOB. Um, there's some dredges there. Uh, I was assisting scientists from all over the world with integrating uh, their needs with what the ship could supply. Uh, there was a lot of interaction with foreign governments and shipping agents and uh, a lot of documentation, which again, just kind of come natu comes naturally to me. And as I got my feet underneath me, I kept picking up more and more responsibilities, uh, things that I saw were falling through the cracks. And after a few years, it became apparent that the role I was filling was no longer reflected in my job description. 
So I was promoted to the operations manager of SSSG. Uh, there I maintained a lot of my previous roles, but I added on a few more officially, which includes um, overseeing our shipboard techs and interns and uh, our equipment management, <clears throat> writing and reviewing reports and proposals, serving on NSF review panels um, and institutional committees. And luckily with all those added responsibilities, we hired a new administrator who was able to pick up some of the low hanging fruit for me. Um, so our customs documentation, POs, agent bills, <clears throat> um, some of our pre and post cruise logistics and which has been especially helpful now with COVID um, because a lot more has been added to my plate uh, these days. So I've been leading risk assessment evaluations uh, for every single cruise uh, that has sailed since really since last June. Um, during COVID times uh, and presenting our findings to both our HUI and our federal stakeholders. Um, I also oversee our SSSG budgets. Um, and right now our Atlantis is actually in Anacortes, Washington, uh, going through a midlife refit. So, uh, you know, lots and lots of different um, pools of money to keep track of there. So that's kind of where I am now. Um, and if I were to have some general advice for uh, anybody graduating anytime soon, first is one that you've all heard many times, but for heaven's sake, publish before you leave. Uh, do not leave GSO without being ready to publish. Um, it took me a couple of years to publish my master's work when it should not have taken me any time at all. Um, hard work and persistence creates your own good timing and good luck. Uh, so, so just pay attention. Keep your eyes open and your ears open. Um, remember that careers and jobs are extremely important, but you need to maintain your sanity. Um, that can be very difficult if you're type A like me. Um, and if you enjoy field work, get out there. Do it now. Like what's holding you back? Uh, get underway and do it as often as you can because before you know it, you're going to have new responsibilities sneaking in to compete for your attention. Um, and last but not least, if any of us have learned anything this year, uh, empathy. We, we all need a lot more of it and we all can give a lot more of it. So with that, uh, thanks everyone to hearing my saga and let me know if you have any questions. I will. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was great. What, what, a, what a just wealth of life experiences you've had over this time. So I think there's probably something for everybody to, to gain from that. And nice to sum it up with your general advice. Thanks, Veronica. Yeah. So any questions for Sarah, you can um, either put them in the chat or you can uh, unmute yourself and speak up. Yeah, and if anybody, if you can't think of anything now or if you don't <laughs> wanna ask now or you're watching the recording later, I am more than happy to um, answer anybody's questions. Uh, you can email me um, or reach out to me. Um, my email is S uh, Fuller, so first initial last name at hui.edu. So um, always, always there to lend a hand. Sarah, do you ever get a chance to go out on the hui ships? Yeah, I I actually meet the hui ships in port more frequently than I sail on them, um, and that's really a matter of because I'm. Depending on which port we're in, it, customs can be very, very tricky. Um, and having all of our documentation, specifically for the scientific equipment that's aboard, um, right. depending on your customs officer, can depend on your outcome. Uh, the rules aren't exactly black and white. Um, so that's usually when I know that there's a really tough port call uh, in terms of customs, I'll go there to be the boots on the ground. Um, also, sometimes when we're going foreign, we try to mobilize multiple cruises before um, it's even your turn. So you might you might be mobilizing in and out of Manzanillo, Mexico. And trust me, you don't want to ship anything to Manzanillo, Mexico, because it'll 
it'll get stuck in customs or um, it won't make it to the ship. So when we're mobilizing multiple cruises at once in our last US, continental US um, port call, I'll be there to help wrangle everything because you can't have four cruises worth of scientists going to keep track of all their stuff either. Um, I have gone on a cruise or two with the Armstrong uh, when I first started just to, you know, get the lay of the land. But honestly, I have so much work to do um, behind the computer when you have limited bandwidth. Uh, it can be really tricky to maintain your shore job while you're also at sea. Um, and something that I do uh, work with a lot of people on, uh, early career scientists. So people that are finishing up their PhDs um, or, you know, are in their postdocs and they haven't yet been chief scientist before. I tend, and they're sailing on either the Armstrong or the Atlantis. Um, often you'll have, you know, advisors, other senior scientists who are sailing with you, um, who will help, you know, help you navigate uh, through things. But honestly, sometimes senior scientists, you know, are so adamant about their way is best. And sometimes it can be difficult as an early career scientist to kind of find your own, um, your own way to navigate being a chief scientist for the first time. So in my role as somebody who works with the chief scientists and the PIs on all of the cruise planning logistics, um, I've... I found a lot of joy out of working with early career scientists uh, who are trying to navigate that tricky relationship that you need to maintain with your senior scientists and also to find your own space and where your boundaries lie and where you should put your foot down and where you should, you know, uh, bow your head and say thank you. <laughs> hey, so when you are on campus, where are you? In case I'm I, over there. Yeah, I'm in the Smith building. Uh, David Smith. Okay. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah, so I actually, my office is right next to all of the Alvin offices. So I'm up on the third floor, right across the street from the Captain Kid, um, and no right way. on the, yeah, right on the pier. And so I haven't been in the office really throughout COVID um, because I am actually, I'm actually eight months pregnant. <laughs> so I oh. added risks there. Um, but I know something that's been really important to me throughout my career is maintaining, you know, a life balance. I spend a ton of time in the field. I love being in the field, um, but being in the field also sometimes means that it's really difficult to have a home life. Um, and so that's kind of what helped to drive the transition from being in the field to being field support. Yeah, great. Well, that's great news. Let us know what happens uh, <laughs> next month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's coming up fast. It's, it, it, I don't know. <laughs> well, you'll just deal with this baby like you've everything else. So it'll just kind of, you'll just roll with it, yeah. I'm sure. I know they don't plan nearly as well as I do, though. <laughs> so <laughs> that's more of the, <laughs> it better be type A. <laughs> Yeah, you may have to get ready for not being in control of everything in your life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In 24 hours, it, your life will suddenly switch. Right, yeah, and uh, adding to the challenge, naturally, you know, I married a mariner, <laughs> so uh, somebody who's at sea all the time. Um, so adding that, you know, twist into the new parent category, uh, along with, you know, maintaining my career. I have no intention of, you know, leaving Huey and, you know, as I'm getting more and more responsibilities at a higher level and I'm able to kind of shed some of the lower level stuff like customs documentation and um, a lot of kind of the nitty gritty stuff that I'm really good at because I'm so detail oriented and it's hard for me to let go of and trust somebody else to do it really well. Um, at the same time, something's got to give and Nobody really likes doing that type of stuff. <laughs> so somebody, somebody else's turn to uh, hold that baton. Um, yeah. Well, you also seem like you've figured out a good way to keep your keep your position moving and improving so that 
it continues to stay interesting to you. Yeah, and one of the big things, as you guys, I'm sure when you chose your um, advisors and as you are looking for you know, career paths, a lot of it is who you work with. It's not necessarily the position. And when I was actually, I was actually offered both positions when I applied to Hui for, I was basically told you can either work for Jason or you can work for SSSG. Which one do you want? And I interviewed for both positions at the same time, which was pretty challenging. And one of the big questions I asked was, what are, what are the growth opportunities? Um, you know, logistics are logistics, but where am I gonna go from there? And there was not a clear path with the Jason guys. And there was a lot more encouraging. Um, they're like, we don't really know, but we'll help you um, from the SSSG side. So that was really the deciding factor and why I went with that position over the other one. So the questions that you ask when you're applying for jobs are just as important as the questions that they ask you. That's good advice. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I just want to hop on and say that there's a lot of thank yous and amazing talks in the chat. Um, everyone seems to love all the information that you just gave us. And um, we have one question mm -hmm. um, from Maya, and she wants to know, how do you find a balance with everything? And I think she's referring to work-life balance. <laughs> um, that's a great question. I think a lot of it is having spent so much time in the field, um, even you know when I was teaching at West, a lot of my best friends were people that I worked with. So um, yeah, you wanna make sure that you're leaving like the dirty laundry at the office door and not just you know complaining about things because that can fester uh, when you're out having beers or rock climbing or skiing or doing whatever. Um, but I think the career path that I've chosen has led to being surrounded by really interesting people who like to do stuff. Um, so that's a big factor is that I didn't necessarily have these totally separate lives. Um, it's only really now that, you know, I'm settling down a little bit more. Uh, COVID has been weird being at home all the time. I'm a very social person. <laughs> so it's been, you know, it's been a mental struggle. Uh, I've been extremely fortunate in that I've kept my job I've kept the roof over my head, food on the table. Um, haven't fortunately lost anyone. Uh, so I'm extremely blessed, but that shouldn't you know, undermine that it's been a struggle for people like me who have been blessed too. Um, so a lot of yoga, a lot of walks, a lot of exploring locally. Like you, I had no idea really pre-COVID how much Falmouth and Cape Cod has in terms of nature preserves and walking trails. And you can get lost on Cape Cod when you think about it. It's like, it's a, you know, yeah, it's summer paradise. The beaches are always crowded. But I never go to the beach. I go, I'd rather be on a boat or, you know, be in the woods. Um, so it's a matter of, you know, finding, and in Narragansett, I will say, same, same story in Narragansett, like without, I was a member at Rock Spot and, you know, if I didn't have a class and Steve didn't have a deadline for me, I would take off, you know, I'd go into the office and at 10 o'clock I'd like go ride my bike over to Rock Spot and climb Boulder for a couple hours by myself and then go back to the lab. Um, so I think something that I struggled with initially was that nine to five kind of tradition that a lot of us are brought up with. And uh, a lot of things, especially in grad school, can't tell you how many times I left, you know, for a couple hours in the middle of the day to go mountain biking. Um, because you do have the flexibility if you allow yourself the flexibility, but that you also have the, um, the self-determination and the focus to, to, yeah, go mountain biking, but you still got to put in your hours. You still got to get all your lab work done. Um, but you don't have to do it before five o'clock, especially in the winter. Um, in the winter, I <laughs> I don't know if everybody wants to hear this, <laughs> David, but I got a student pass, um, the New England pass for skiing. And so I would leave on Wednesdays at five in the morning by myself, drive to Loon with my laptop in my backpack 
And I would ski like five or six runs. Then I'd go in and sit in the lodge and I'd t tell myself, all right, you have to write for an hour. And I would write for an hour and then I'd go back out and I'd ski a couple more laps, come back in, you know, maybe have a beer while I was writing and, uh, you know, and go back and forth. And I honestly will say that I think I got the best part of my writing for my thesis done doing that type of thing because it was the exercise and like charging your brain and kind of the feeling of freedom was so, generating so many new thoughts and ideas and ways to phrase things. But sitting on the chairlift by myself thinking about, you know, is that how I want to, you know, organize that? Is that, uh, should I have done that extra core? Like this, that, and the other thing. So when you're not sitting at the desk, you can still mentally be working on all of your work. So don't force yourself into a box if you don't have to. That sounds great. <laughs> I had no idea though. How's that? Yeah, <laughs> I try to keep it on the down though. <laughs> it sounded like it worked. So that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It took me, it took me a couple of years. I probably, to be honest, coming into GSO, because I had worked with Steve for so long um, while I was at sea with him for years before with OET, I really already had all of my data collected. I had all my sea time done. Um, you know, I really had to take my coursework, which, you know, some semesters I'd take five courses at a time. Um, and I'd really load it up because I knew that I would be going back out to sea uh, for the spring or the summer. And uh, that being said, I probably could have finished like within a year if I had just, you know, put my nose to the grindstone and tried to write everything up. But grad school is really fun and it does allow a lot of freedom. And it, you know, the people that you're with are gonna be some of your best friends for the rest of your life. Like I, two of my bridesmaids were GSO alum. I, had all, I probably had 20 GSO folks at my wedding. Um, I've also been a bridesmaid and a maid of honor for GSO alums. So the friends that you're making now, you know, sometimes your friendship actually gets stronger after you leave. Um, so, and who knows, you could be working with each other down the line. So <laughs> maintain your contacts. That's good advice. Sarah, do you see anything else in the chat for questions? Um, no questions, just more comments on <laughs> students. People trying to follow my lead, but cheating by not writing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to do you can't just leave. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be there all day on a beautiful Sunday kicking yourself. <laughs> well, I think maybe now's a good time to, um, to, to close the open part of the presentation and then just leave it for the students. And, and so I just want to, again, thank you, Sarah, for yeah. giving this presentation and allowing people this. I, that's what we like about this series is you know, everybody has an individual pathway and I think it's so important for the students to see that and, and you, you have a lot of experience so and again Sarah's email is in the chat and we'll put it with the recording and it'll, it'll go out and on the waterfront tomorrow so we can be sure to, to get in touch with her if you have questions and I also want to put a plug in um, our next speaker in May is going to be Jamie Mon um, who is one of our slightly older alums. Um, he just retired from a career working with a consulting company in Massachusetts. He was a student of Candace Oviatt's in biological oceanography. So, and I know Jamie was on here today, probably you know checking about how it goes. Um, so he'll have you know a little bit different perspective because he just retired. But we're trying to sort of mix up all these uh, all our alums here because we have a bunch of alums from all age as well, 60 years. So again, so thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much for being our Earth Day speaker. I think this was a good way because we learned a lot about the Earth too. Yeah, get out there. We only have one of them. <laughs> yeah, and like your art forms are pretty neat. Any last comments for Sarah from David or any of the other uh, non-students? Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, for nice, nice job. I had no idea you ditched work as much as you did. Well played. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I still graduated, Bauman. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, thanks all. I see Marianne's still on here. So she, actually Marianne wrote it in the chat about being at, being out a reach scientist. So yeah. Thank you very much, Sarah. Oh, of course. I, I mean I loved doing the outreach work. It was so much fun. I felt like that was skipping skipping school too to go do those programs. <laughs> and you get paid for it. Yeah. So <laughs> good. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Marianne. Take care. guys bye Bowen. i'm gonna stop the recording now so. all right sarah has to go to class yeah. yeah so diana is gonna take over um just moderating the questions